Today we're going to talk about aesthetics and design and the looks, which is right up till now you work on your technicalities, how are you going to make sound, how are you going to sound in fouls, and you're going to learn more about that, like a lot more. But today we're, I'm going to, I want you to think that the looks of your instrument does matter. Like if, if you have your processor, your teams, yeah, you say this is my instrument, okay, but like have a valid point to say that like this is why I want my instrument to, I don't want to do any shields for it. I don't want to put any knobs. I just want to present to you my processor. Um, just have your reasons. If it's if you want to say it's cool, it's cool. Like being cool is a valid reason. <laughs> well, like just have it. Just don't say like, oh, I didn't have to find. Um, a lot of the things that I will go through might be very basic. It's it's going to be very very basic, but I think it's important to. When you're facing the back page, you're like, what instrument am I going to make? How it's going to look like? How it's going to sound like? It's important to go into the base cell and know what it means. And you all come from very different backgrounds. And you have designed something. You have designed your future to come here. You have designed your life, how you look, how you dress. You have designed a lot of stuff. But no, was there think about the discipline of design just being like, I obviously not going to be able to cover it all. It's a whole study. People go and study to become a designer, different kind of designers, graphic designers, system designers, interior designers, architects, composers. It's very broad, but there are some basics that I think that we all share. What is design itself? We all we all know what design is, right? Yes. Yes. So like if somebody tells you what the definition of design based on a dictionary, what does it mean actually? Like if you want to get to the nitty gritty of it. Based on Merriam Webster's dictionary, it means that we are constructing something to a plan, like we are designing a system for an inventory or our folders on your on our computer we're designing a system the second definition <clears throat> means to some kind of plan out something in mind i don't know your coursework planning a robbery or <laughs> um yeah it's something in your mind that you're making it happen and you intend against a purpose it's also related to you're designing it for your future and you're trying to conceive what is in your brain on paper or on your computer. Um, you're designing something for a specific function or end. These are all basically the same meanings, but you can look at it from different perspectives. And when you look at it from different perspectives, you can maybe you come up with ideas. Sometimes when you read the same thing that you already knew when you go through it and you encounter it in a different context and from a different lens, you can. It might trigger something in your brain, which leads to new things. And then trying to do design and work, sign or name, like your signature, when you, you're designing your signature, unless you write your name. And then when you write your name as a signature, you have designed it. Pattern sketch, like architects are designing buildings. And then plans for something. These are all redundant. They, it's the same thing, but from different angles. And you can see which one makes the most sense to you. So when you're designing your instrument and you're looking at like, what am I going to make? And some of you may already know. So please take these things that I'm telling you and see how you can enhance it or think of it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Wikipedia says exactly what Marion Webster said, but like it emphasizes on how you're prototyping it a product or a process and you have a finished product after you have designed something. And when you're doing it, you're taking into account different consideration, aesthetics, which we will mainly focus on, the functional, which we'll focus on, on it a lot, like all the things you have learned is for your instruments to function. And then the economic, um, Sorry. The economic considerations, sociopolitical ones, and environmental ones. All of these are important. You can't, even if you consciously don't think about it, you can't just say like, oh, I'm, I'm only thinking about the aesthetic. 
somehow the environmental, the function will creep in into your work. Design process, everybody has a different design process depending on your discipline and what you're designing or the person you are. So you might start from exploring your hands-on person, you start working with the material and then you create something. Or no, you have, you have to sit and sketch it and draw it, or you have to go, I don't know, in nature, sit there and look at the stars and then be inspired. You all have different ways of making stuff. In the discipline, they, I don't think, a lot of disciplines have this. You have the design method, which is the tools that you are given to. Here, you're given to the programming, you'll learn how to 3D design, if you already don't know and how to put things together. And these are the set of tools that have been given to you in your own discipline to design something. And it's not that you can only design to use the tools that are in your discipline. You can take something that you learned from product design, graphic design, take something from your music class, everything, combine it together to create the tool or the object or the system that you want to do. These are referred to design methods, which it started in 1950s when people were going to more disciplines and more design disciplines for America so that they can be taught and can be transferable to other people. Um, and then there's a the design thinking, which is basically the steps you go through. And it's the procedures you, you a lot of times it, when you talk about it in the design discipline is, the practical things that you're trying to design, like there's a problem, you find a solution. Or if there's no problem in the industry, you want to make a problem that you might want to make the person just like, you can do this easier. So I'm going to design something that'll make your life easier. But it might not have been a problem before. It might not have been an issue, but we live in a world that we can, we can afford making those things. Um, Oh, this is very dark. Oh, okay. This is what, when you Google design thinking, this is what the, that graph, the graphic that they show you, you conceptualize, you explore, and then you actualize it. It says it's in this order, but it doesn't have to be. You can go explore. Like I said, you can start with your panels, your objects, your speakers, whatever you're designing, start with those. You can start with your... I don't know, pen, paper, anything you have. You're not limited. You explore it, maybe you make it, and then you're like, oh, I am actually solving a problem. You can go in any other way. So you don't have to do whatever it is in this area the system tells you to do. It's for you to be aware of these and then for later to be able to break them, to know that you have the agency and the power to do that. Also, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. And then we have the elements of design, which when, I, when I'm going to talk about it, you will all know about it because it's something that we encounter every single, like right now we're encountering all the basics of elements of design. But I really like this quote. It says that in order to understand the aesthetic in its ultimate and approved forms, one must begin with it in the raw, in the raw, in the events and scenes that hold the eye and ear. So you have to go in the raw, like I have this sanitizer, you want to see what shape it is, what color it is, what texture it is, what is the smell, what is the function, when I test this, what comes out of it. Um, yes. So you want to go into the basics, even if it's obvious. I will talk about a bit in music form. Today is more about the general and the music form. A lot of you, which I know, know about these basics, so please bear with me. First of all, is the form, is the shape of something. And it's not that it doesn't matter what the content is. This can be a vase, this can be a water bottle, this can be a music shaker, it can be anything. So it's the shape. No, it's the form, it's not the shape. Shape is a different thing. And when we talk about music, oh, this. it's going to be generic or natural. The shell was natural. You can find it in nature. And then the geometric, it's man-made. You're creating it. You're designing it um, as a human. 
well, there's human impact in it and influence. And then for your designs, you can go and combine with the, these two together. We have so much resources in nature and you want to make something similar to nature. You take, go outside, go to your close to beaches, go to the beaches, go into the woods, explore, see what natural things are there that you can take that and make a thing you want. Musical form is how we structure everything in time. Like a pop song, you have verse, chorus, that's the form of it. How much repetition we have, how, what sections we take and we repeat. Again, this is a whole course on like musical form. So I can't really, this is all I think you need to know. And all of you know, like if we have this. Oh, wait, sorry. But here you start with the third, the chorus, and the I don't really use the music. It's a music class. It was some music. Well, we have the verse, and the next time the chorus comes in, you have heard it. So four matters, but then there's so many different kind of forms in music. There are forms that like are not, it's not as exact like this. You need to listen to it to hear what the actual form is. And then we And it repeats again. So your eyes, your ears have heard it before. Um, when you think, when you're designing your instruments, see like what is the capability of the forms you can produce? Can you repeat stuff? Can you create new material that in real time you can have a variety of forms? See what you can do. Like maybe, I mean, the more, less is not, less, is it less is more? Mm -hmm. Less is more. But like sometimes less is not more. Maybe your instrument will have, be more stronger if you can develop different kinds of forms. Or it depends what instrument you're making. You know. Here we have the shape. Pick lives in form. It's not form, but pick has a form. And it's defined by the lines and the boundaries. And everything we see has shape. And like form, it can be natural, it can be geometric. Yeah. It's all the boundaries, like everything, you can combine different kind of forms, shapes together to create this form. And then you have a form. When you're designing, see what buttons you want to create. And then, because those buttons, like the mini little shapes that you have in your instrument, will lead up to the general and natural form of your instrument. Geometric, natural. And then we have the music. I love this I made interpretation because I might not. I think shape and music will be the gestures and the phrasing that you have in your music. Like how each phrase, musical phrase that you have in time are shaped. Like here, these are final signals. And then you can see these are like interrupted and you can hear those when you, I mean, this is sound like this. All of these are. All of these have different um, all of these have different gestures. So they start that you have a beginning, you have an ending, and those gestures can go longer. And those gestures 
can be so long that they turn into textures. So it's hard to say when was the beginning and where was the ending. It's very, very crucial that your instrument can generate different kinds of gestures, I think. So you can play more, you can sculpt more, you can shape more with sound. And then you have natural sound, which is the way the ocean sound. It has its own sound, it goes up, it comes down, it's usually predictable. And lines, everything in design is made from lines, whether it's like a continuous line, it's a broken line, it's a thick, thin, light, heavy line. And I think the important part of the about lines is that it's, it impl implies that continuity. So when you have a line, like if you have a strip of line, that means that you're continuing. If your FSR is placed in a way that you're it's in a line, it continues, it's not broken. The human brain, based on its intuition, knows that it has to go up, it continues. It's not an interrupted thing. But then you can take that and play and say, I'm gonna do, draw, have an FSR that is not interrupted, it resembles a line, but actually in reality, it will, it's going to make interrupted sounds. And then you're playing around with the human brain, which is kind of fun. And then minor music, Okay, I don't know what lighting music would be, but I think it's it will be layers of sound, which leads to texture, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. It's also it can imply linearity and non-linearity. And if you hear something from beginning to an end, one point to another point, or you hear things at the same time, which leads to texture. All of these textures, when you look at I hope, when you look at it, you can know how they sound, how they feel, what's gonna like what would your reaction be if I draw my nails on a grid? I mean, some of you I wouldn't like it. Um when you're designing your instruments, think of like what textures you can play with. And because like textures are it's feel, you're dealing with a human type, you're it's the closest thing you will get. So if your button is something soft, is something fairy. I don't know if it's possible to have a fairy button, but um, think of it because then the interaction of us as humans will be different. If it's like something like cement, it's hard. You think that a hard sound will be generated from it. But if it's soft, you, based on your intuition, you might think a soft sound will generate from it. If you have a fluffy ball, it's like you might think it's gonna make cute little sound noise, but like in reality, you might not. And then you can use contrasting elements to show that different sounds are being generated through your instrument via texture. Tactile, visual, audible. Tactile, we touch it. Visual, we look at it, but we somehow, based on our experiences, we know how it looks, bless you. And audible, which takes us to musical textures. Musical textures. You have when you hear one song, one line of music, it's usually called monophony. Monophony, and then you have one layers. There's no interaction within different layers. It's linear, and you hear only one texture. This one. I get the idea. And then different sounds, different textures. Even each sound has a different texture to it, it has a different quality. And the individual sound that's being created. Okay. 
Okay. Color is very obvious, I would say. Everything has a color, but what you design does not necessarily have to be, doesn't have to, doesn't have to have color. I mean, black is a color. But you don't have to use all of the saturation, but use it like intentionally. You can use colors to organize stuff, to make contrast to something. You can use it as like focal points to emphasize on something, on an object, on a button. A lot of times, like a lot of controllers let you design the color of each button. And that um, helps it in like color coding, if I'm performing, if I see like all my orange buttons are like drum pads, then I know what I'm touching, then I don't have to look at my computer while I'm performing. So it helps the performer to play more easily. Um, and then you can use dominant colors, supporting colors to combine things together. You can, well, that's some wall I'm gonna say. And then you have color in music is the timbre and the tone quality of each sound. A violin has a different color than a synthesizer. Each synthesizer has different timbres. A cello, an oboe, they all have different colors. Like here, here's one of my favorite artists. Basically, playing with a mixer has a tape, tape, tape recorder, and there's like a pedal for he's playing. And he can create all these different timbres with the effects he has, with the sound he has, um, and how he is manipulated. Your instrument can only create one timbre, and that is totally fine. But like, if you want something more versatile, you can use an instrument that like does not create quite a bit of like timbres, or you have at least you have the potential in your pocket. You have the ability to change those timbres and colors. Then we have the symphony. Okay, I'll try to go to I still have to figure out the level. Yeah. And all of these instruments have, like, the composer has given each instrument its own role, so, like, to create, like, a wholesome piece, but each color is presenting and doing something different. And you can do the same with your instrument. Or you can combine it, you can make an instrument that has all different colors. Like you can a bit replicate the string instrument, a bit replicate a bit of a replicate a wind instrument, and you, you can combine all these together. And in space, everything exists in space, whether you're looking at your computer, it exists in a virtual space, in the physical world, it exists in the in a space. And then in design, like how you create space, like there's space around something, above something, below something, surrounding of something. And the negative space outside of everything matters. Like how much space are you gonna give your button on your slider or your microphone? All these you need to take into consideration when you're thinking about your interface. And space also plays a role in emphasis. Like if you give a big knob and give lots of space around it, 
you're drawing the attention, the audience attention to that focal point. Um, yeah. And space and music can have different meanings. You can either through the technical technologies that we have, we can resemble a space. Somebody can be sitting downstairs in the listening room. If you haven't seen the listening room, please go and see the listening room. Happy to show it to you. Um, we have the system that we're replicating this place in Europe and Middle East, everywhere. Like you, you think you're in that space, really. So we have Shadarian singing in Karma, but downstairs in the listening room and replicating as if he is in Hakka Sophia. In reality, it's not that reverberant. He's literally talking like this, and but through the technologies we have upstairs, which is called the cavern system, you can replicate that space, which is pretty cool. Go see it. Um, And then we, through the sounds we use, we can give it the illusion of the space, which, I'm sorry. Oh. I think you're in the middle of the water world and you can hear the show, you can hear the show the other way. Space is very powerful, take advantage of it. And then we have movement, which can be implied. It means something is moving, something is in flow. You're moving from one point to another point. It can be literal, you can see literally it's moving, or it can be implied. This is a painting by Marcel Duchamp and Paul Staircase. You can see how, like, through these straws and shading and colors, um, you get the illusion of movement. And you can use all the basics that we've talked about, the shape, the textures, the color, the shading, the space to imply movement. But right now we have the technologies to literally do movement. And the movement in music, Although it has different a uh, different name, it can be it's something that I will relate it to speed, tempo, rhythm, be something that moves your body. Um, or it has an occasion of moving. Because in music, anyways, we are like moving through time. When you play something, we're dealing with the medium of time. So move, movement is inevitable. My friend current artist. I can listen to it all day. Um, um, what elements do we use at, and when? We use all of them. Whether you want it or not, we're using all of them. Um, so this has a shape, it has a form, it has colors, it has it taking a space in the physical world. All of these have literal spaces above them, around them. Um, maybe it doesn't have movement, but if we move it, it has movement. So it's capable of being moved. Questions? And then we have the principle of designs, which are methods that we through basics of design, we use these principles to design it. 
Again, we don't have to use this principle of design. Um, but these are ways to think when you are prototyping, sketching, or thinking about what you're going to make. We have unity and variety. These are standards in the design discipline. I don't know how much, a lot of it can be transferable to what you will be making. I think all of it will be transferable, but the degree of integration of these in your design might vary from one, what you're making, from one thing to another object. You have unity and variety. That means like these are patterns, they are all the same. You establish something, you're giving the eyes the repetition of pattern, and then you have variety which disrupts that pattern. How can you disrupt your pattern in your instru instrument? Think about it. Um, and when you have this, it says that nothing, like say in this rectangle, this part, there's nothing that is more important, like all of these are equal. So if you have a drum pad, all of the drum, the pads will be the same. They're creating like the same hierarchy, same importance. And then you have balance, like we have balance in life, we're going to have balance in our design. Um, it doesn't have to be symmetry, it can be asymmetric. So you can use, like sometimes I can use three little things, they will balance the big thing. Or you no, know, you take all the big, th you want to make everything little, little and you use one big thing. Again, that is balance. And then you have to have literal balance, that if you're think, thinking of designing a piece of clothing that is going to make sound. If you take something, your processor is so heavy that you're just gonna destroy your clothes that you have designed, then no, you have that balance. Physical physics don't have no balance in the literal form. But then you can again play around with balance. Say no, I don't want balance. I want something that is imbalanced and that's intentional and that's my artistic or creative decision. Then go for it, but be intentional. Um, another thing about int intentionality, sometimes you come up with mistakes, mistakes or accidents that you weren't planning for and it wasn't intentional, but then because you like it, you take those things and make it intentional. At the end, they will become intentional, but the first time, I mean, the first time you encounter them, they were not something deliberate. Yeah. Um, hierarchy. Like, okay, here, marketing, enjoy. It's obvious, like Coca Cola is the main subject, but like enjoy is something that grasps your eyes. And then, because of the color contrasts and the size and proportions, your, your eye is supposed to enjoy. So, when you're, if somebody gives me a big interface that has a big circle on it, I will look at the circle first. Even if I wanted, like, I, not admit to myself that I am like, I'm falling for the trick they put in on me. My eyes won't go, and I'm human. I will go see the big thing or the brightest color. I will see the red button. And that's why they put the red button because we, they want us to see the red first. So it'll be easier. I can turn it on and turn it on faster. Same thing with your instruments. Contrast. Um, this is something that you can use. It's a difference between two or more things. You can use it to apply hierarchy and it drives focal point, but yeah, use it because then you can mm -hmm. differentiate from one section to another section and different things on your interface. Yeah. Emphasis is similar to contrast, but it is not the same. You can use contrast to rise emphasis. Basically, when you look at this, for that point, you're looking at the end because you're not really paying attention to that painting. Maybe at, at the first encounter, you're looking at there. Um, obviously, with all of these things, the more you spend time with an interface or a medium, your perspectives might change. You might think about more of, oh, I actually am interested in this little a line over here but as your first encounter with that thing 
think about what's going to be for the first person who's looking at your scale, proportion, the size relative to each, the size of everything and the shape of everything. Um, these, this is the thing that creates balance, it can create contrast, can create emphasis. So all of these are combined together. One might not be separate from another and you can use everything to design something. Repetition is a repetitive pattern as we saw in the unity and variety to create the feeling of continuity and familiarity for the person who's encountering your instrument. It might be even yourself. Repetition. And when you're designing your instruments, see how you can create a repetition. But sometimes, depending on what you want, but if you want it for a performance, it's easier for a performer to repeat something while they are looking for something else to do. So it's nice to have that aspect, that um, component in the interface. Um, yeah, so design elements from design with design principles, combine it together, design your thing. It's not that easy. I, it's easier said than done, but that's um, the basics. But then you take it, you ignore everything I said, and you think differently. Take it, use it, know it, and then break it. Like you can throw these away, but at least be aware of it. Know that these exist. Um, yeah, form versus function. Does form come first or does function come first? Do they live on the same stance? Um, at first, uh, the Sullivan, he the, the father of skyscraper architect, said that like form follows function. But right now, that I don't think that really is true. But some disciplines, it might be true that form follows function, but I don't think it does. Because you take some, like if something doesn't have, it's doing a function, like if you see this in the store, but there's like one that attracts you, it talks to you in, an, in the way that like, it evokes your emotions, you will go for that. It's something like the form matters. It's not only about the function. Yes, it's a water bottle, but why did I buy the blue one? Why did I not get the, I mean, I like the black one too, but like, you know, something maybe a color that I don't like. I don't like, I don't like yellow. Why did I not choose the yellow one? I will choose the one that matters to me. I will choose the one, the form that talks to me. So again, make the instrument, make the form matter. Yes, it's supposed to make a sound, but like, how is it gonna make the sound? How are, we, how are you gonna interact with that to create it? Hmm. Like, look at all these things. This is a clock, literally anybody, like if all we need, oh, where's the clock? That's a clock. Um, there used to be a clock, I think. But also this is a clock, but like, I want to make up to this and not to that. This is a lamp, but it's also a balance lamp. So it's supposed to make light. I can use that lamp or I can use this lamp. I will go with this. But again, you might hate these designs and these words might not be yours because everything is subjective. Speakers, I love these speakers. I also love this speaker. Tables, this one can, it's like, you can actually take it and modify it. It has the balance element that you can do in any shape that you want. Pot, and everybody has a pot, but one look like this in your kitchen. Literally a napkin or holder, like the wall hold. I don't know what these are called, but hanging wall. Okay, right. but you can see all these can be when it's on your wall. Maybe it's more pleasant for you to look at it than if it's something that you might not necessarily like. And this, it's a speaker, it's a radio, a vinyl player, all of these. I think it was called a scissor, scent, helmet. That's why when we're thinking about 
form we think about the aesthetic consideration. The thing is, aesthetics are complicated. It's not, there are a lot of papers written on aesthetics. Nobody has one single recipe for what is beautiful, what is ugly, what is pretty, what evokes my emotion, because we're all different. We all have different tastes. We're all dressed differently today. It's different. Gauss says a thing without aesthetic is like food devoid of flavor. If functionality is what a thing does for you, aesthetics is the way it does to you. Exactly. Look, think about it about food. I mean, some people eat to be to survive, and that is totally fine. But like if you love food, you don't want your chicken not have salt, pepper, a little bit of paprika, garlic powder. You want it to have all those ingredients to like enjoy it. We like enjoyment. I think humans like it though. So yes, it's complicated, but based on a dictionary, I think it's pretty cool. The aesthetics is the philosophy study of beauty and taste, which is related to the philosophy of art, the yes, which is the study of the nature of art and how we explore, we interpret, interpret, we conceive. And we perceive um, art. How we judge something is beautiful and tasteful. Um, it depends on you. It depends your educational background, cultural background, social background, or how much exposure you have had to a medium. So I'm Iranian. I find some things very like some dishes, like food dishes, I find very tasteful, which I when I explain to my friends who have lived in a different country, they think like, what the fuck? Why are you eating that? <laughs> um, but again, it's like I find it aesthetical. When they put it on the dish, I'm just like, yum, like I want to eat that. But some people were like, oh my god, I'm gonna puke. Um, so it's complicated. But the most thing that I think the thing that is common is that we deal with aesthetics on a sensory level. It, it's with our emotions. But at the same time, it's not only the sensory level, it's our brain, it's our cognition, it's our encounter and our reflection on the thing we are exposed to. Whether it be a piece of music, a food, a piece of clothing, a back of shoes, um, a phone. Um, David Hume, I think that's how he said his last name. It says that it's like we don't necessarily know need to know this every single ingredient that something is made, and my ingredient can be any element of what is something is made from. It's about the pain and pleasure and how we feel, literally the feel part. Emmanuel Kant says. Enjoyment comes from sensation, but taste and beauty has needs our cognition, needs our contemplation. So we need to reflect on something. We need to have some time with something else, right? Yes, intellectual, emotional, sensory, all of it all at once. That's why it's hard to describe. Because one day, the thing is, like, one day I will wake up and think this is beautiful. Three months later, I have read some stuff. I have talked to people. I have lived in a different country, and I think this is very, very ugly. So that's why it's complicated. You will, you might not find something that is beautiful today, beautiful in three years. Your taste will evolve, will change. I wish I had better examples on this table. Um. When everybody thinks beauty is different. What you think is beautiful might not, I might not think it's beautiful, what I think is beautiful, you might not think it's beautiful. But what is important when you're designing, make something that's beautiful to you. And you will, and by beautiful is like it evokes something to you. You're expressing something, you're even making somebody angry, like you engage us, you create complications, you like you touch the brain and emotion. 
Yeah, it's complex. And to be honest, you can make an instrument that doesn't evoke any sensation and you say as it is, like this does not evoke any sensation in me. But while we are at this class and we have the resources to evoke something, I encourage you to take advantage. So you're dealing with a medium of music and sound. This is what we experience and everything beyond the function. So besides function functionality, it gives us context, meaning, and essence to what it is that we are making. It's from the textbook that you're supposed to read, which I'm hoping you're reading. Um, for matters. And then we have the functional considerations, which is the purpose of what you're making. What is the goal of the instrument you're making? You need to ask yourself the what? What is it you're making? It's an instrument. Well, what kind of an instrument? Are you making it for it to be performed? Are you making it to be an installation? Are you making it to be a toy for a kid? All those things, ask yourself. Ask if it needs virtuosity, how much, what is the limit of your instrument? Can somebody sit on it and then become a virtuoso of, I don't know, um, your instrument, whatever it's called, like the wobbly wobbly, like it's like, can we be wobbly wobbly performers? We don't know. How much flexibility? How much flexibility does it have? Can we play it in different contexts? Can we play it in a and then go play it in a, like a sit down classical new music concert. Can it be can it be an installation and yet at the same time um, an instrument to be interacted with? And why are we making it? You can say because it's cool because I want to. That's valid, but just have a why you're making what you're making. The why is important. And then again, who's performing it? Is it a child performing it? Is it a pianist performing it who has keyboard skills? Is it somebody who has no has never had encountered a musical instrument? Is it somebody from I don't know a different culture who's trying to learn a different other culture? Is it for school? Is it people with disabilities who is playing your instrument? And it might be you, but like who are you like? Think about like what you want. Um, and the hows, like how are we gonna do it? How are we gonna express something? How are we gonna make it aesthetic? How are we gonna make it flexible? All those things. All that to say that they affect each other and one cannot exist, exist without the other. Sometimes it's sex, like it tilts over here. Sometimes it tilts over here for other designers and depending on what you're designing. And then we have the economic, social, political, and environmental considerations. Economic, does it cost you? Does it cost somebody else to buy it? Does, can you remake it? Can you reproduce it? And then social, political, there's so many papers on this, um, which I did not read. But <laughs> what are the impacts? What are, are you, is it like a political instrument? Are you trying to make, uh, differences in society. What 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 are you trying to do? Think about it. And then yes. The question about how you make uh, design considerations in a different environment. For example, like you come from an American background, correct? And like here in America. Now, how do you continue to design in ways that affirm your background, but also understanding that you might be in an audience that is not legible? And how do you make up the differences between where the design is coming from, the inspiration, versus mm -hmm. like the audience and the interpretation? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, Okay, honest, I'm uh, very honest answer. I've been living in North America for six, seven, six years. 
when I first moved here in my first year, when I was doing composition, I was trying to fit in. I was trying to make what is aesthetic of here. I'm just like, what like what do people listen to? What's what is my audience? Who is my audience? I went to concerts. I was like, oh, this is what American and Canadian composers write. So I want to make something like that. That's what I did for my first year. And then I saw that the industry here likes foreign things. So likes Iranian things. So I started using my Iranian stuff and people liked it actually. And now, first year, I was running away from my background. Like, because you, Iran is different, it's very different. And you come here and you're like, I don't fuck, I don't wanna make what I used to, I will be judged, people won't like me. And I was 18. So I really, really wanted to fit in. Um, I even dressed differently. It was a whole other situation. Um, and then now, which I, I, I don't know, I'm just, my music is changing a bit, and I'm trying to relearn what I learned in my cultural background to design what I think, something that doesn't forget my background, but also I have learned so much great things here in North America. Like I've learned so much. So how can I combine these two together, which I'm not just using something Iranian for the sake of gaining attraction, but also that like I'm actually respecting where I come from and combining, respecting what I learned here. Yeah. Um, environmental. What is your effect on the environment? You can go and use like we re go a max that we have like cupboards of like recyclable stuff. Like these are literally some people like we don't want this, they're gonna throw it like, but you can do really, really cool stuff. Go use that because you're then upcycling it to something that is meaningful to you. Or like you're reusing it and that matters, then you have less impact on the environment. Yeah. I mean, I use stuff that is not good for the environment and it's bad, but like some things you like I'm gonna sit here and say like we would just use like things that are good for the environment. So, I mean, do it, but it's hard. Questions? I put these like in the language jumping to another section. I'm going to go through auditory potentials, which is going to be very quick because I've already talked about it, but I'm going to emphasize about it again. Um, which, when you're designing, these are literally practical stuff. How much range does your instrument have? Is it going to be one octave? Is it going to be two octaves? Is it going to be unlimited? Can you do any frequency that you can? Or are you going to put a limit? Boundary, boundaries are nice, make your things easier, but if you want to have no boundaries, have no boundaries, be my guess. Um, dynamics, how loud can your instrument play? How quiet can your instrument play? Can your instrument literally shape this room if we have like five subs? Can it be like, can it be physical? Or no, your instrument is very quiet in this like empty silence for us to hear it. Or can it be connected to a mixer that can be amplified and then give you bigger dynamic range? Textures. Can be as a monophonic instrument, polyphonic instrument. Can you play different kinds of sounds at the same time? Um, yeah, as I said, I'm biased towards having different textures and layers and having multiple um, options while playing. But it's up to you if you want to make something that resembles a flute. Please do it. But then think about it. Know that know that there are other possibilities, but you make this decision. And then that is very out. Amber, what kind of sounds can you make? Is it just one sound that you're making or is it multiple sounds that you're making? Um, that can be used through different oscillators you're using or have like 10 effects, maybe not 10 effects, but like have multiple effects. And then that can change the timbre of your sound. Yeah, and then are you using like natural sounds at all in your sounds or only textural?
Um, this was also okay. For the rest of the class, we're going to go and watch musical examples. So I can give you some ideas of what you can do and what, yeah, what you can. All of these are achieve, achievable. There are not like a lot of these, like people from 250A have touched on it, or you have all the resources here to do it. All you need is maybe the resource that you're limited on is time, but it can be a long term. Oh, this was not supposed to be here, but this is unnecessary inventions. He just he makes un like physically not useless, but like I mean we can't live without it. Sometimes opening a can can just be way too loud. That's why I invented the decimal diffuser. Let me tell you how first we got a can beverage and open the lid to slide it into our airtight chamber. Then locate our trademark hook and pulley system. So you can grab onto the cans tab and open it ever so wide. Now reach in and grab your newly opened beverage and enjoy it without anyone hearing a thing. <laughs> so if you want to make an event like a musical invention like this, I like, I don't know, do it. Or is it this? Thing? We've already got the cup holder, the remote stand, the snack bowl, and the outlet. Like this is cool, like it's a table that you can interact with. Jigsaw was a product by the computer today in the model of our brand new table accessory. I decided to go with this grayscale color scheme, so I got those set up and going over on the 3D printer. And I was really excited to see if my idea was going to work, so I grabbed them off the printer and checked this out. Flick the rip, and now it extends outward and slides back into place. Now I can start combining all of the different pieces together to make one complete accessory. It was already looking pretty good, but now I was trying to see if it fit inside the table and it snapped right into place. I easily slid my phone into the holster and now it rocks back and forth and telescoping up so I can use it as a tripod and put it back down. Now I just got to decide what's the next thing I'm going to build. Yeah. And we've already got the cup holder. The remote. <laughs> okay. This very blue who is a Canadian artist and used made 3D printer like these discs from William Blur that um, creates sounds like acts like a MIDI controller and has lights on it and just engaging to watch. Yeah. Basically inspired by toys, like mm -hmm. it's like something that you can play that's painful, you spin, but also it can be unpredictable and hard to control. Yeah. Victoria Shen used to work. Is does she work somewhere? No. No, oh, she's here in sport. But she's usually in the Max Lab. She's pretty cool. And here she will tell. Me. And she makes all these instruments for making sound with, and all from like usually recycled sound manuals. This data thing. Connected. See connections where maybe there aren't any. It's just like I always do that, and I just want to always make that connection. The bridging of like different discourses to each other. Materials themselves can be pretty inspiring. For instance, like this project just came out of the fact that I had access to spare piano parts. How can I make something with them? So it's just like me exploring their properties or like the, the limitations or the edges of boundaries of how far I can push this medium and what its capabilities are. Yeah. 
The advantage of using sound over visuals is that you know visual almost always has a, a reference. Like you look at anything, and then there's always going to be like a slew of associations with it. Like helpful bag, I know what kind of emotion is supposed to elicit. Or with sound, I think there's a little bit more unexplored territory and freedom in sound. I try to think about creating a space where you don't know. I recommend looking at the work when you get a chance. Oh, this is that's this nail that man you play that creates sound with the dry on the venue on the venue on the she makes the intent of But you can think about it, you have designed it in a way this could be like in a in one place, but like it's mobile. So she can walk in her performance, be interactive, and sometimes goes through audience. So there's the capability of that. Think about that. How port portable your instrument is. Um this is the the sensor table, so it has all these sensors which Um, then you have Kyle Evans, which is this TV that acts like an oscillator, he moves it, it's visual but it's auditory it's interactive um and it provides a performer and art like program that wants to compose for it the capability to engage the audience too because like this is a tv everybody has seen the tv but then who's taking it and turn it as a and it's like I know someone will look at a accordion, you have all these buttons. There resembles a lot of stuff that the human mind is familiar with. But then with sound that they might not necessarily have heard. And this is open source, you can go and look at the code in the application. Probably has made it oscillator. And, then... and you can totally make something like Bending is basically you take and bend the circuit, like you change what the circuit is supposed to do. And there's a lot of there's so many things I learned when you guys kind of silly because they usually take toys, kids' toys, and they do it to it, and they all sound like bizarre.
Necessarily sounds nice, but it's not ideal. Again, the same thing, made exactly like his first name. I don't want to get out. Burmese, I can guarantee a lot of you have one of these somewhere deep down in a basement in a cargo box. It's probably still talking to itself, but maybe there's a use to these annoying and endearing little creatures. What about Burmese on a stick? Nah, ain't quite there. What about a picnic? There's got to be more uses than that, surely. Well, for the past few years, I've been dreaming up of a machine that will finally keep these tragically discarded little dream boats in use. And here's a concept picture from a few years ago of the machine in question. And finally, after trawling through eBay, rummaging through charity shops up and down the lane, and a heck of a lot of soldering, I present to you the Burby Organ. <laughs> and here we have 44 free range home grown and Burby values, which have been extensively modified using the fully patent for its Bullman's Burby fusion synthesis modification circuit procedure. Along with a beautiful old filly that wouldn't look out of place in your grandma's living room. These Burbies were able to sing, chat, and play in a dreamlike state, hooked up into the mainframe in the back of the machine. They are heavily sedated. I don't know. <laughs> It's kind of like the matrix. So, without further ado, let's flip the collective awakening switch. A couple of them have gone back to sleep. You also have the ability to stop them in their tracks by pressing the loop and freeze switch. We're there. Each of the Furbies are able to also generate a performance of our little notes. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 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 Okay, now that's exciting. Um, you can make things from sound, no, solar panels, and then you like you can just have an installation put in the garden using nature. It very creates a motor, moves a motor, and creates. Involves that, and then there's a bead machine. On. Oh, this is the fourth bead machine. You can see each of these little platforms are made of contact microphones, so that the small objects attached to them uh, get directly amplified. There are the needles of uh, tiny voltmeters. And then when I send a signal, uh, they get triggered, so they hit the objects that are attached. This is a spring that I removed from an oversized pen. Uh, there is a metal pin um, that I use as a bass drum. There is a more pin capsule. Um, right, I use a snare drum. Uh, there is a guitar string. And when you amplify it, uh, the small insignificant 
cells that you can then in here uh, turn into something like this. Right now, I'm working with the beat machine number five. I'm planning to make it out of. I think on the first day, we'll go through like uh, hybrid instruments, and you can learn how you can amplify things like anything you have, like your, again, like your water bottle, um, and see how you can turn new sounds that make very little sound. Things that make very little sound into like things that actually make like bigger dynamic, right? Um, and then you can, as I was saying, you can make fashion where you can design something and then embed like the sensors or speakers to it to create wearable electronics. So you can make your body make sound. And all the best sensors that she used, you have it in your kit, I think. And it's like, I think there's a flex sensor that might not be in your kit, but you can ask us if you want to make something like this and we'll give it to you. I think. I mean, you can. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's available. And then there is Dr. Sasaki, a speaker dress. She's basically singing, and these are all. Speaker, so she's a walking portable speaker, maybe making sound. As a mic on her head, and this house is blowing. Mm -hmm. And their effects, like here, yeah, I don't know if you can see, but like, and I think some other person in her body, she has like embedded systems like hold on to her in her dress, like you can probably see. Mm -hmm. And then Barbara Nerea's PhD student here, talk to her. She's very cool, she has lots of ideas. He made this set. I have trouble saying the stethoscopes. It's like a stethoscope. What is that thing that doctors use? That thing. And then she uses bio signals to pick up the heart and then turn it into use it as a musical instrument in concerts. Again, I think she made this in 258. And even you see, it's simple. It's like algorithm. And it's not that simple, but it's achievable. All of these things are achievable. Augmented seashell, this is, okay, this is mega simple. You literally just take the sound that you want to make, the processing might be complicated, but you literally put the contact mic in the seashell, you pick it up, then you have the sound of seashell, and then you have that sound as your sound source to play around with it and put lots of cool effects on it to augment it. Um, Airflowland, get. DMA at Alumna here made this with a master's karma student here, which is an magnetic, um, electromagnetic pre preparation for the piano that picks up the vibration and it allows like to play things that might not be achievable on a piano, like a good sango or sustaining for sustaining it for a long time. So what it's basically doing it is augmenting the piano. Um yes. It's a complicated, this one is a complicated system, which I don't, don't know how it really, really works, but if you read, read it out anyway. Um, Stephanie Chang, again, an installation and an instrument. Let her tell me about it. 
Wendy's work is um, all of the sound that you'll be hearing is um, mechanically generated from the, this object. So it's um, a vibration motor that's this here with the nut, just like in the older work that I did. Um, but hanging off of each one is this jingle bell or sleigh bell. And I've prepared them each so they're kind of muted with a piece of tape. And then wired in parallel is an LED. So anytime it vibrates, it also lights up. And uh, it also corresponds to the intensity of the, the vibration. Uh, so again, when I was working on this project, I found that I preferred performing with it instead of installing it. So I decided to just bite the bullet and design a controller that would be uh, more convenient to perform with and have some more expressive control. So I started prototyping this. Um, I'm using Arduino Omega, started whatever, soldering everything, putting it together, kind of made an improvised design as I was building it, I decided how I would arrange things. And the end result is this. So you can see um, there's a series of switches here and the mouse is hard to see over that, but um, each switch controls a bell and that basically what it does is it turns on the bell. That's nothing new. Um, but what I added, so let me turn on the bell here. Oh, and you know what? I need to power it up. Okay, so let me turn on a bell. So here's one bell. It's uh, currently um, looping, just turning on and off at a set time. So these knobs here that I added control the knobs will actually get louder and brighter. The lighting effect. I'll fade the thing here. It's kind of awkward because I kind of improvised adding it on. Uh, it's a coarse sensitive resistor. So um, all it's measuring is how hard I'm pressing on it. And I have two modes. Um, one where if I press on it, it'll speed things up. So now it's now, as you can see, like she's taking something that already makes a sound and already exists, recycling, upcycling it, and then adding her. She is controlling the sound because these jingles usually make sound in an uncontrolled way, unless like you hit it, it makes sound. But then how she's doing it, she's augmenting it in a way that she's in full, almost full control of how the gestures they're making, the shape of the sounds, how they move, the speed, and movement. Yep. And if you don't know what material you can use, maybe this is a good starting point to go and see, look at the Max Labs, uh, not junks, but I mean, some of them are like, honestly, I don't know why they are there, but like, then go through it and see, maybe you can use that. If you don't know where it is, um, I'll tell you where it is. Um, way these work. And then this guy. I run, I run a lot of uh, my instruments and uh... I can act, I was thinking I can demonstrate an ability right here. This one is a uh, machine that uh, it's kind of like a loop, so it starts here and then and then the circuit can trigger something, it goes here and it triggers here and goes around. So if I trigger it here, it starts. <coughs> Then I can add like the in the pickup, I can add the motor. So. Then uh so it takes up the sand and it drops it onto the uh, on the lever and okay. like very subtle sounds, like just literally sound sound. And like this replicates breathing, natural sounds. All it's like, it's like, like what's the easiest creative. way to pick up sand and drop it onto something? And you like take it brain. Brain. Uh, Rob? Um, this is a, I recommend watching the book um, talks by Ableton. 
It's very cool. They have lots of ideas. They bring lots of speakers. If you have the time, watch it. You can just put it in the background and you'll see some of the different ways you can make this one. Um, to engineering and other stuff. And they made these fire dolls that are very cute. <laughs> Four matters. This could have been literally a speak, little speaker, but like they made a few dogs and now no. <clears throat> Mike Molshan, previous TA of 250A, made this interactive installation, which was actually a Kama Garai that first he had like this hanging speaker. I don't know how many speakers, like 20 speakers, and had like distance sensors. So when you get close to it, it will make some different sounds. If you get far away, different sounds. There were three lamps up there. When you hand, when you pull one, there's different sounds you could hear, another one, a different sounds, but then the light will also play. So you have the visuality, they have the auditory. And then there's little like a radio station when you get like, a thing. It does something. I don't I can't remember what the radio does, but it's cool. He's around and if you don't know him, talk to him. He knows a lot. He was meant to be when I was taking this class. Um okay. Um, um, The person said we want it to be air that I can see. I guess there's only one. And I think you have distant sensors in your kids. Yes, you have. And then when you have an installation, you cannot predict what people are actually doing. So there's that. So this is Barbara who did this tech fed park space. So I want to talk very much. Um Imogen Heap made these gloves, which are a lot of people like here and to behave as like a history of making gloves, which I need can go easily do. But not easily. I, I don't know why I say easily, but like achievable. And if you plan it ahead from now, you can do it. That's what I mean. Um, and when you break things down into steps, everything is easy. Um, she has these gloves like through like Motion like from X, Y, Z, moving your hands. Um, like I think it has flex sensor, so if you do your fingers, it can change stuff. And I think it has FSR, the type sensor, so if you touch stuff, it will change. 
auditory things. Also, music recommendation, tiny desk concerts. Watch them, they're pretty cool. Fred again played on one recently. So and uh, sometimes I just, or maybe I'm not to stay. Um, so I'm singing a song, but first from a second page. So I don't want to answer. Um, uh, um, Here, the most of she puts her hand on my right. Now, at the beginning of the she recorded her own sound and then she was looking at her sounds. I found the same thing on this tutorial, moving the previous. Um, another person who works um, with gloves here, I think he was also with his DATA, is Doug McCrowsland, who's graduating, but check out his work as well. He had a concert. I don't know if any of you, if you came to the concert on Friday night, but he does really cool stuff with gloves. Um, watch this one. Uh, no one land mm, has graduated from Karma. He used to be an alumni, and then he created these gun triggers that make sounds a sound installation. Um, <clears throat> just touching on political stuff, social stuff, while also creating sound. Um, So these sounds could have been made from like different percussive instrument objects as well, but he decided to use gun trigger, making a statement. Um, yes. So again, political considerations. And then last, 
Yeah, this is the last thing that we show you. This air sticks, which is like these drum sticks. It's easy for people who haven't like what is it again? Um they don't draw, but they it's an easier medium for them to interact with. So it's meant for beginners, intermediates, advanced people to come and they can make percussive sounds without having to actually play a drum. But it's in the air, air sticks. And you can load different synthesizers on it and you can control visuals. So basically it's a controller in the form of a stick. It could have been a different way. It could have, it could have been like this, but they form decisions, aesthetic decisions that's going to be a stick. Any audio thoughts? These are the S6. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, that was the last one I was going to show. Um, so you see all these examples, you can take what you like from each of them or say, no, I hate all of them. I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't want to do anything like this and that is fine, but just get yourself exposed to these things. There are more examples. Happy to send you more. Maybe I'll show more on Monday, next Monday. Um, meanwhile, Please, please, please start thinking about your instrument from the high. We're week four. We're week four, and there's not much time. And based on experience, like at the last week, everybody will come and panic and be like, what? Oh, and now your final presentations is on Monday. Um, so please think about it, even if it's like having your subconscious or like sit and just the weather is nice out there. Go and sit 10 minutes under the sun and just design something or think about something and see what is important to you. Just don't panic up. You have other courses. Yeah, you ought to say that. Don't email us on Sunday night before Monday and say this is not working. Have it ready by Sunday. Very slow on responding and emails during weekends. Um, so, yeah. Any questions? <laughs>